Hi, Bob Greenier here, volunteer with the Mountain Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, so a quick update on the Lion 4 takedown that we did. I had some feedback from Lion himself, and he said that actually the second core here, which was on the left-hand side, if you look at the front of the reactor, this actually was a live reactor as well. And you can see, uh, and we saw on the day when we took it down, there is some... Uh, meltdown here. So I think I'm going to do a session where I take this apart also. Uh, so that was actually two live reactors in this one and he was interested if there was any crosstalk between the two. So we'll do what we did with the other one. We'll crack this open at some point and look at the inside core and I will mark that into separate sample containers in here. These are the parts from uh, the right hand side core. Now I've had that right hand side core on um, uh, detection with the radio code 101 and that has been there for about 8.5 days and I've updated the blog um, here uh, with that data and uh, really there doesn't appear to be anything above background so you can see the image of that there um, and I've also uploaded the images from the uh, session that we did and uh, you've got a GIF anim there with changing the lights and here's some of the lovely images that uh, we took and in fact you can click on these images and it will load into another browser window and you can zoom into those so if I go here and I go up to this one for instance this is uh, both a stack focus and a tile of stack focus images so this is actually quite high res you can move around this and have some uh, good idea of the overall um, thing what's going on um, and uh, I also looked at um, what possibly could have caused the um, sort of acrid smell um, when I was breaking this apart and you remember I broke this apart and I saw these bubbles and then shortly after I noted that there was this smell and I thought was it fluorine was it chlorine but it actually kind of didn't smell like either and I last said bromine so I actually um, put um, into the Parkamov reaction tables um, uh, to see if bromine was a possibility but before I go on to that there is this uh, um, a reaction that's possible between a copper oxide, uh, so cuprous oxide, a cupric oxide going to cuprous oxide, and, and it's reversible with oxygen. And so it's possible that uh, there could be some oxygen pumping from the environment uh, to create bubbles here, but then oxygen wouldn't actually smell like uh, one of these kind of uh, uh, acrid type of or, or sort of smelly gases. Um, that I thought might be bromine. The, the other thing is, is that the meltdown with uh, uh, aluminium oxide here, that I've included a paper uh, here somewhere where there is this reaction um, with uh, copper oxide and alumina, and they go into different phases. And one of them is uh, copper aluminate. And so, and one of those reactions is reversible. However, once you get... Um, I think a particular type of illuminate kind of stays there, but it might be the case that the, the temperature was suitable to do this kind of reversible reaction uh, between uh, copper oxide and, and aluminium oxide um, to help this uh, meltdown, but it does imply that the temperature was really rather high uh, for that to occur. Anyway, you can go and read that in this um, uh, link here. And anyway, so I, I pumped those into the reaction tables for Parkamov, and I found that if you have nitrogen 14 in the air, uh, which is surrounding this, and you take copper 65, that actually goes to bromine 79, and we've got a neutrino coming in the left. And we know that reactor was running over a thousand degrees, and so the, according to Parkamov, there is the possibility to create neutrinos and antineutrinos. And then also, there's two to two reactions here as well. And there um, is the possibility with none and oxygen 18, which is a rare isotope of oxygen and copper 65 to go through to bromine 79. Or you can have uh, an, a neutrino coming in from the left with oxygen 17 and copper 65 or 63 to make bromine 81 and 79. And there is this possibility of nitrogen 15 and copper 65 uh, to go to bromine 79. So um, given the fact that these are the rare isotopes of oxygen, how could we get to oxygen? Well, we know we've got deuterium in the reactor and we know that it is seeming to do uh, certain things. 
Uh, and so if we actually take uh, deuterium and we take nitrogen 14 from the air, we can end up making oxygen 16. And if we take deuterium and oxygen 16, which obviously is in most of the oxygen, we end up with oxygen 18, which is uh, the most uh, likely fitting it into a small box reaction um, with copper 65 to make bromine. So there are actual paths to bromine here. Uh, I actually show here the um, uh, reactions between deuterium and the sort of oxygen and nitrogen they have in there. And uh, you can make other isotopes down here, but one of them actually here is fluorine. So there is a potential path to produce fluorine. But I think actually um, there is, that you can actually make, like you make a cuprous oxide and cupric oxide, you can make cu cuprous uh, bromide and cu cu cupric uh, uh, bromide, I think it is. And so um, it could be that in this material here um, under SEM, we may see some uh, bromine, even if we don't uh, capture the gas, if there's a chance at some point to look at it under SEM. And if that's the case, then um, bromine could actually be a possibility for being produced here. And the interesting thing is it's made from copper and oxygen and enabled by deuterium. All of these things are in play in this reactor. So anyway, that's the um, review of uh, the update for this um, takedown. And uh, we will do a takedown uh, at some point of the other core, core one as I'm calling it now, which is the left-hand side. And uh, uh, that's it, basically, and uh, yeah, so uh, no real signal coming out of um, uh, the long-term eight-and-a-half-day sample, really over background, so it's all safe. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you in the next video.